Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Cribble Weekly Demo. Enriching security data with DNS Lookup. So before we jump in, I just wanted to take the time to introduce myself to those of you that I haven't met. I'm Desi Gavis Houston, and I'm the Senior Solutions Marketing Manager here at Cribble. Previously, I led the national development team, um, national sales development team, excuse me, at a co-working company called Industrious. And before that, I was on the sales team at an ad sales enablement company um, called Media Radar. I also built the sales development team at Trello. So my path to Cribble is a little non-traditional for sure. And I've been in a few different industries in my career. Um, ultimately, though, it was kind of a no-brainer for me to come here to Cribble just because I really um, I really enjoy matching people and teams with tools that give them more flexibility and choice in their business. And ultimately, that's what our flagship product, Cribble Logstream, provides. I'll get into this a little bit more later. But Cribble Logstream acts as, you know, a universal router um, and receiver of data. So whatever products you have in your stack, Logstream is going to enable you to be able to get that data wherever you need it to go. So great to meet you guys. Here's what to expect on today's call. Let's get into it. So almost every week, we'll be doing a full demo of Cribble Logstream and walking through specific use cases in the product. Uh, so first... I'll do a quick introduction to observability pipelines and log stream for those of you who may not be as familiar with us um, with that concept or what we do. From there, we'll move into a full demo of log stream. So we'll talk through the specific use case for that week. Obviously this week, that's gonna be how to enrich um, your data using our DNS lookup function. Um, then you'll have the opportunity to ask any questions that you have regarding Cribble. Uh, about Logstream or anything you've heard or seen here today. So uh, just a quick note here for those of you that have seen Logstream before, work with it every day, or are just super familiar with the tool, you'll likely find that the first half of this call covers concepts you already know. Uh, we'll get into the specific use case at about 1.40 Eastern time. So about 40 minutes from now, feel free to go grab lunch or five coffees and come back and join us for that part of the webinar. Um, and I am going to turn my video on now as well. So global data is growing at a 25% compounded annual growth rate. And I think everyone in the world understands this to a degree. If you take uh, being in a global pandemic, for example, right now, more than ever, organizations are making a massive transition to remote work um, and companies are having to provide new equipment. Uh, maybe even new infrastructure in some cases, as well as use new programs and applications so that their employees can work from home at the same level uh, or a higher level of productivity than they were before. Um, new programs and applications means more data sources and more data. So even if you think about it from a non-technical perspective, it's pretty easy to see uh, data is growing astronomically. And by 2025, enterprises are going to be managing 250% more data than they were just last year in 2020. So the amount is growing, uh, but there's another problem. Logging systems are already at capacity. I hear from enterprises daily with costs in the millions when it comes to licensing and the infrastructure required to store this growing set of data can cost as much or more than commercial licensing costs. More data also means you need more CPU dedicated to analyzing it. Uh, and for many customers, so the added infrastructure costs can be in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, on top of all that, you get inadequate data retention in some organizations. When your logging system is reaching its limits, many people believe they have no choice when it comes to dropping data that they ultimately like to keep around. So to get the answers you need out of your environment, you have to onboard new sources of data. There's just no way around that fact. Um, most companies drop large portions of high volume sources because it's just too difficult and costly to analyze everything. Uh, you may have retention policies in place to meet certain standards and regulations, but you're having to play some guessing games, right? How long can I afford to keep a wider set of data around? You might even need to revisit that data later, especially if you're investigating a security breach, right? Or you're trying to understand long-term trends in your IT environment. And for some use cases, they may need to keep data on hand for years. And that data needs to be ready for analysis that entire time. Lastly, Systems are optimized to handle data analysis and retention separately. So what that means is you often end up using many different tools to retain and analyze all of your machine data. And adding each one of those tools also adds complexity and hidden costs. 
So like I mentioned before, uh, environments are getting super complex, right? You have your object storage, your time series databases, your data lake houses. Each of those is going to have their own agents and their own ingestion pipelines. It's really tough to manage it all, and it forces enterprises to make some hard choices about which data to send to where. And with choices come trade-offs. Uh, you end up playing kind of this three-way tug of war, right, with cost, flexibility, and visibility. I mean, the more data you analyze, the longer you retain it, right, the more it costs you. Standardizing on a single tool, that's going to limit your flexibility um, and maybe even limit, you know, which teams within your organization you can work with, especially if you guys are using different tools. And dropping data to keep costs down could limit what you can learn or investigate over time. And it's really hard to investigate a security breach that happened six years ago if you don't even have that data there to go back and analyze. So how do you do it, right? How do you manage the trade-offs of analyzing everything you need to get insights from your machine data formatted for all the tools that you use uh, without busting your budget? Well, an observability pipeline solves all of these problems. And our product, Cribble Logstream, helps teams implement such a pipeline without replacing any existing tooling. Cribble Logstream enables customers to choose what data they want to keep, in what format, and in what data store, all while providing the assurance that they can also choose to delay any or all of those decisions with a full fidelity copy in low cost storage. Cribble Auction is going to provide you with a vendor agnostic solution to route data to and from any tooling source or destination. Um, so I mentioned, you know, trying to standardize on a single tool before, right? Truth be told, in organizations, a lot of them anyway, um, you have different teams using different tools. Um, Logstream is going to enable you to route data from team to team, from tool to tool, without any, any trouble whatsoever. Um, regardless of which tools are in use, again, to kind of harp on that point, Logstream can centralize the forwarding of all machine data, get it to the right destination, and ensure it's shaped, enriched with whatever information you need, and ready for analysis, or simply on standby for when it might be needed in the future. And then lastly, Cribble Logstream significantly decreases an organization's logging and monitoring costs. Uh, we see our customers get about 30% of infrastructure costs that they save on average, um, I've seen customers get a lot more than that. 30% is just the average that we see. So one question that might be uh, popping up for you is, you know, isn't this just Kafka? Like Desi, doesn't data streaming already exist? Yes, it already exists. And the data streaming solutions that do exist, there's not purpose built for polystructured data. Um, on the other hand, an observability pipeline like Cribble Lockstream, it's purpose built to work with even the most complicated data formats. So the data you need probably exists in multiple sources with different protocols that dictate how that data is generated and collected. Um, you've likely got data coming in a variety of formats, and they may not always match the formats required by the tools you use. You probably also come across streaming solutions that just couldn't scale with your business requirements. Cribble Logstream can, and we've tested it at over 20 petabytes of data a day. So if you remember nothing else that I've said today, please remember this. Cribble Logstream is an observability pipeline to route security and machine data where it has the most value. We help slash costs, improve performance, and get the right data where it's needed in the formats required. With Cribble Logstream, you can reshape, reduce, or route data so that you remain compliant and get the insights you need in the most cost-effective way possible. So next, I want you to see the product. Uh, my colleague, David Maislin from our solutions engineering team has graciously recorded a full walkthrough of some of the key cases of Logstream. So let's take a look at that now. Hello, I'm David Maislin. I work for Cribble. I'm a principal solutions engineer. And today we're gonna be giving you a brief talk of our product features, discuss the distributed deployment architecture, and cover some basic concepts and show a live demo of Cribble Logstream. So first off, what is Cribble Logstream? Well, when you have logs, metrics, and traces, and you're trying to get the data from your sources to the intended destinations, it can be quite challenging. Logs can be pretty messy, ugly, noisy, 
And sometimes you just want to see the signal and not all that noise. And not only that, all those events, all that extra traffic can cost a considerable amount when we're talking about your storage or your license. So Cribble Logstream will allow you to implement an observability pipeline and help you to parse, restructure, and enrich the data in flight before it lands in the data analytics store, which will get the right data where you want it in the formats that you need it. So first off, when we talk about routing data, sometimes data doesn't always land in one place. Uh, you want it to land in many places. For example, uh, some of your data could land in Splunk, other data might land in Elastic, but all of your data, just to keep it for future reference, uh, security investigations might need to land in S3. So we allow you to route your data to the best tool for the job or all the tools. We allow you to translate it, reformat, enrich it into any schema that you require because different departments have different needs for analytics. So you can put the data where it has the most value. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, data can be quite large, noisy. Uh, there's a lot of times when people leave things like debug on uh, without thinking about the impact that it might have on the end data analytics store. So as much as 50% of that log and metrics data goes unused. Uh, there's null fields, duplicate data, fields with just no value at all. And with Logstream, you can trim that wasted data stream and analyze only what you need. We also allow you to collect data from multiple sources in pretty much any format using the tools that you already are using today. Splunk forwarders, uh, Windbeats, uh, Elastic, various plugins, Syslog, whatever it might be. We allow you to reach out and collect the data using REST, Firehose, uh, HTTP, TCP, and pull that data from Microsoft Office 365, for example. And once we pull that data in and it lands in the intended destinations, one of them might be something like S3. If you ever needed to replay that data, pull the data back in at any time, you can simply select a few buttons, pull that data back in, and do ad hoc data collection uh, for later investigations. And lastly, you want to shape your data. You really want the ability to process machine data before you pay to analyze it so that you can transform it, you can enrich it with lookups, GOIP information, or other specific information related to your specific company business. Uh, you can parse the data, restructure the data, so that you can focus on that signal and not the noise. Let's talk about the architecture for a distributed deployment of Cribble Logstream. As I mentioned earlier, we support all the sources that you can probably think of. Uh, we're gonna be able to collect data using Splunk Universal Forwarders and Heavy Forwarders, uh, Elastic Beats agents that have integrated load balancing. Uh, you can send data via Syslog, uh, FluentD, HTTPS, uh, TCP, TCP JSON, and finally, the pull sources uh, using an API will go collect the data from the required sources like Kafka, Amazon S3, Kinesis, SQS, or Azure Event Hubs. When that data flows into Cribble Logstream, we place Logstream worker groups uh, a collection of worker nodes that sits closest to the egress point to save money. The idea is that if you can reduce all the noise, trim the data, drop events that simply don't matter at the source, like in the cloud, and maybe you're sending the data to another cloud provider or internally to your on-premise deployment, then it's gonna save you a ton of money on your bandwidth. It's going to reduce the amount of traffic flowing into your solution like Splunk. It's going to free up additional license cost, uh, increase search performance. All of that is controlled through the user interface in the master node that's integrated with Git and your repos for version control. 
which we'll cover during the demo. Once the data is processed using log stream routes and pipelines, it's going to land or go to the destinations of your choosing. So some of the data will go into Splunk. Other data might go into Elastic. Some data might need to go to S3 directly and never land in either store or all of the above. The flexibility is tremendous. Let's talk about a demo. So first and foremost, when you land in Cribble Logstream, you have the ability to monitor the events in and out, the bytes in and out from your various sources. As you see here, And you can see the status of the sources that were healthy, were collecting the data, and the destinations. In this case, we can see that one of the destinations is having some challenges. Cribble Logstream in the worker nodes can do persistent queuing and other behaviors such as rejecting events or dropping events depending upon the intended or required behavior that you choose. In this case, we could set it up such that any data that can't get to the destination can simply queue up in a persistent queue across the log stream worker nodes until the destination is back up. Maybe you're doing a maintenance on the Splunk infrastructure on the indexers. Maybe it was a network issue. Maybe it was a restart of the indexers, uh, something like that. Uh, you won't worry about losing any of your data. If there's any challenges, all of the data will be retained with full fidelity. And again, you could also send it to multiple destinations such as S3. Let's review some sources inside of a worker group. And again, a worker group in this case, we're going to call it logs. This could be AWS, this could be Azure, this could be uh, on-premise, whatever you decide to call your worker group. We're going to go into this worker group. Now, the first thing you see is you are in the routes. And before we discuss what the routes are, let's talk about the sources. So here you see various sources that you can configure to receive data. Uh, so if, for example, we wanted to receive data from syslog, you select syslog and you can add your various IPs. We'll receive data on any port over UDP or TCP. We support TLS, syslog over TLS out of the box. Another source could be Splunk, whether that's the HTTP event collector or Splunk TCP. We act just like a heavy forwarding tier or an indexer in that we will receive the data. We're not going to store the data for analytics, but we're going to process the data just like Splunk. So you simply add a new source, configure the IP, the port, and you can even whitelist various IPs, uh, configure the line breaking, event breaking, add additional fields, and do any additional pre-processing before the data enters the routes and the pipelines. Let's take a look at the routes. So what you see here on the left, from the top to the bottom, is as data comes in, we're going to match data against a specific filter. This might look somewhat familiar to you. This is JavaScript expressions, uh, which is a very universal language. Uh, so that we basically have said, if data comes in for Palo Alto network traffic, then process it with a pipeline. A pipeline is a set of functions that is applied to a route. Finally, output the data to one or more destinations of your choosing. And at the bottom, you see final. 
final means you're done with this data, this specific type of data. Do not go to any of the routes below that you see here. The next route we see is the archival route. It says true. So all data that hits this specific route is going to pass through. No filtering, no functions are being applied, and land directly in S3. This isn't final, so this means that data will continue down the routes for additional processing to land in additional destinations. If at any time you make a decision, because in this scenario, we said that the Palo Alto traffic is final, it's never going to land in S3, and you wanted to make sure that all data landed within S3, you can just drag the route and change the order of processing. And now what we are saying is all data that passes in through these routes is gonna go and land in S3, including the Palo Alto data. Once you make a change, you just simply save the change. And as you see here, you can commit the change because we're integrated with Git and your local repos as well. And I'll just say changed the order of the routes to include pan data. Once I commit that change, I can deploy those changes. And once I do that, the workers are gonna be checking in every 10 seconds. And in this case, the logs worker group is gonna check into the master, notice that there's been a change to the routes, pull down the changes, then they're gonna process the data according to those changes. Once the data is done being processed, it's gonna now land in S3. When it receives the change, the config version here will then turn green. That happens about I don't know, somewhere between every 10 to 30 seconds, just like you see right here. It is now green. Let's go back to those routes again. And now we're going to take a look at some of the various pipelines that we've applied to this data. In this case, we're going to look at trim big JSON data. This is the filter that it's going to match on. We're going to enter the pipeline from the route and here we see we are now in pipelines. We have a comment. Comments allow you to document everything that's happening within a route or a pipeline. And in this case, we're going to capture some data right now live from the various workers in the log worker group. When we capture data, you can see that the filter expression carried over when we enter the pipeline from the route. And it's going to allow me to capture the data from the various worker nodes, adjusting the time frame that I capture, as well as adjusting how many events I want to capture and where I capture those events. As they enter the system at step one before processing, as they enter the various routes and processing pipelines, and as they exit for various post-processing, and finally, as you see here, on the way to the destination. So let's just capture the data before it gets processed. We'll hit start. Now we see the events are flowing in, and they're captured into a sandbox. This is a, a temporary uh, staging place where you can create new pipelines uh, with various functions and test out the behaviors before you deploy it to the various worker groups. If I don't do anything and I just stop my capture now, it's going to expire this captured sample after whatever time frame you set. If I were to rename this, something like that, now this will no longer expire until I choose to delete it. It's helpful for keeping a template of the various events that you're processing through Kribble Logstream. Let's save this as a sample file. Once I hit save, 
we now see here on the right that we have data. These are very large JSON events. We can recognize the format of structured data so that if I select expand, I can now see the JSON object. And the one thing to note is what we talked about in the comment earlier is we need to remove multi-header and null fields from the raw event. And we're going to apply a function called parser to the data. If we look at the data on the right, as it comes in, we see body, we see headers with 20 items and headers has the various accept and cloud front and other bits of data. But there's also a redundant field here called multi-value headers, which has the same values that you saw in the headers field up above. We also noticed that there's some null data here. Why would you want to pay for data that has no value? Let's look at the parser function. We're basically saying for the source type of Lambda, this function is going to be processing the event. We are going to remove the multi-value headers and the null fields and rewrite raw using a reserialize operation. We could just as easily extracted fields as the extracted fields like you would see within a data model uh, inside Splunk by changing the operation mode. And in this case, since I know the data is JSON and I'm applying this function to the source field of raw, here's what I'm going to do. Remove multi-value header field. And this fields filter expression basically says only keep events that are not null. Value is not equal to null using the expression here, the JavaScript expression, uh, which matches on the value and the type as well, ASCII or numeric. Let's take a look at what would happen if I send the data on to the intended destination. Well, first, when I expand the object, you'll notice that multi-value headers is gone. Null values have also been removed, but yet the event has been re-serialized in the proper structure, something that would be pretty much impossible to do using things like sed command or regex to manipulate the structured event. If I wanted to remove additional fields like request context, just type it directly into the fields to remove. Hit enter and hit save. Now again, this is not being applied to the worker groups until I commit and deploy the changes. And if I made a mistake, I can roll back to prior, prior releases of the changes uh, with the click of a button. Once I added this new field, let's take a look at the savings. So now, almost 65% of the event size is gone. It's been reduced, but we've not lost any of the value of the data. The full fidelity still exists not only because we've removed redundant fields and no value fields like null, but also because all of the data is also landing in S3 in case you perhaps needed to see the original event before you reduce the event. If in the future, once you deploy this change to your event, your manager says, you know what, we actually need this field, so please uh, add it back into the data, you select it, remove it, hit save, and what you'll notice is now request context is now included in the event sending on to your destination like Splunk. If I take a look at the changes now, it still shows that we're removing about 45% of the event, a tremendous reduction in license. Uh, because you've also removed redundant data and null value fields, it means less data is going to land on your indexing tier 
And that means your searches are going to be much faster. Further, because all of the data is landing in S3, you don't have to retain the data for as long because it's not very often that you're asked to run a search from three months ago and display the results. We're looking at the here and the now. Other reasons are because the data is in S3 untouched, you might want to replay the data in the future. So sometimes organizations have set up clustering and replication, which can take your data that's been indexed and make two to three copies of that data across your indexing tier. That can cause additional performance issues. Well, now that you have the data in multiple places and can replay the data at any time, you could make a dis decision to reduce the amount of retention, saving infrastructure costs and storage costs because you have less data in the environment because you're no longer needing to cluster or replicate the data, that's going to increase your overall performance. And finally, the reduced events, that's going to save your organization a tremendous amount of license that now has been opened up for other data use cases, which would allow you to pull in additional data. So that's a review of a single function in Cribble Logstream. We see trim big JSON. Let's review something a little more complex and more powerful. We'll take a look at Palo Alto firewall traffic. So I've entered the Palo Alto traffic from the route and I'm in the GOIP enriched pipeline that we see right here. This pipeline is a collection of many functions that exist within Logstream. These functions include things like the ability to aggregate data as metrics, uh, perhaps, again, adding comments, dropping data, sampling and dynamic sampling, compression, keep one out of every 100 events that are from trusted zones, for example. Regular expression extraction, I'm sure many of you are used to that. Uh, updating your props and your transforms uh, can be difficult, and sometimes you can make mistakes. We allow you to parse data out of the box, and all of this is done through the user interface. There's no need anymore to update things within config files and have to deploy them out to the indexing tier uh, and wait for indexer rolling restarts, for example. Let's review this pipeline. So again, we're commenting. What I'm saying when I enter this pipeline is if somebody accidentally said, send the data to this pipeline and it's not matching the source type of pan traffic, you're final, you're done. Don't process that data, leave this route because we're not going to accept that data that doesn't have that source type. The next function is parser. And as you see here, it says on all data that was allowed to enter this pipeline, its filter is true. So all data that comes into this pipeline, I'm going to extract all the events from that all, <laughs> all of the field names from that event. Let's take a look. Here is data as it comes in. It's in the syslog protocol. We can see that here because of the facility and the log level exists right here. Uh, we can expand that. We see the common delimited event. This is what the data looks like as it leaves this pipeline. All of the fields have been extracted as well as enriched, which we'll cover in a moment. Uh, this is, in a sense, a pre-built data model. These extracted fields will land in Splunk, and you will be able to search for them uh, using tstats. It's basically building your data model before you have to do it inside of Splunk, which can affect the performance of your indexing tier. You no longer have to run data model acceleration every five to 15 minutes. And again, it's a tremendous improvement in the performance in your environment. The fields here that you see within 
this parser function. I just simply copy these and pasted them from Palo Alto's documentation on what represents a Palo Alto traffic event. If at any time you didn't want to pull specific fields, you can remove them. You can decide which fields to keep, which overrides which fields are removed. And again, like you saw earlier, you could decide to not index any null value or events that just simply don't matter, like placeholder events, for example, future use. Let's minimize this. And one of the things that you'll notice is I created a group. So that way I can easily understand what is happening within my pipeline. The first group is extraction and reduction. And I have other groups below here. In the extraction and reduction, I also have a drop function where if a log subtype equals start, the event will just simply get dropped. It could be if you have debug logs coming and you choose to drop them because you don't want to fill up your indexing tier with debug at, at any given time because nobody told you that they were going to turn it on and perhaps they accidentally left on debug and it's going to uh, have a dramatic impact on your indexing tier. Other things that you could choose to do would be like sampling. If I'm getting bytes in is equal to zero, maybe keep one out of every five events. That's what we see here. If I'm getting data in from the firewall from trusted zones, internal networks, uh, maybe keep only one out of every 10 events, which would again be about a 90% reduction of your traffic that normally gets indexed but never searched. Nobody looks for it. And this is on or off. I could turn this on with the simple toggle of the switch right here. Let's move into enrichment. In this case, uh, we've again commented, we're going to do GOIP lookups against MaxMind for the source IP and the dest IP. And we are going to output a result field, source underscore GOIP and dest underscore GOIP. And we see that right over here on the right. We see the city, the continent, the country, the locations, the postal code, subdivisions, and things like that. That was done on an event by event basis, pulling in the data, enriching it at search time because IP blocks change. And in six months from now, in a product like Splunk, if you were to do a search lookup against an external IP, the location according to MaxMind could change. And so it might be best for you to add the enriched information at index time for the purposes of a security investigation. Maybe a year from now, you needed to replay that data from S3, having the comfort knowing that this information was enriched before it went to S3 and landed with that data means that your security team will have accurate information when they recover that data. We of course support other things like lookup tables, uh, reverse DNS, where it'll take an IP and match it to the DNS host names, as well as maybe internal CIDR notation, where I'm saying if the IP address comes in and it's internal, do a lookup against this lookup table and return the CIDR output. Other things that we do would be to look at compromised tables. This is a value expression which says look up the IP address information. And let's do a pop out here. Look up the IP address information against the source IP or the destination IP and simply match on that. And if it's true, then return the result or false, as you see here, all done within our UI. Additional routes and pipelines might be used for the purpose of sensitive data. And in this case, masking data, like from a business event we see right here. So for business events, uh, maybe you're looking at this 
data sample right here and you say, what is the effect of this function to look for social security numbers, credit cards with LUN algorithms, things like that, we have built-in expression matching that you see right here. We said, go look for a social security number pattern and mask it using an MD5 hash. This is what it looks like as the event comes in, and this is the masked event as the event leaves the system to the intended destination. We do the same for regular expression. If you're working within the solution and maybe you need to do a regular expression extraction on the fly without having to go to external sites where you might copy sensitive data and paste it to a site where you're not supposed to do that, you can create your expressions directly inside Logstream and create the match right here inside our user interface. When you're done with the capture that you might need to use as a field name, you simply save it. And then what you will have after you save it is a new field name right there. That's the power of Cribble Logstream. Now I've shown a lot of various capabilities of Logstream, how data comes into routes, how data uh, is processed within a pipeline, and as I've talked about, how data might land in multiple destinations, including S3. And as we know, we don't retain data in the data analytics store for very long because the storage can be enormous and expensive. So by reducing retention, maybe from 12 months to 30 days, because that's typically what a lot of organizations might do when they use Logstream, the infrastructure cost is going to go down dramatically. But Logstream, if you ever had your security team call you and say, hey, we need to recover data from all the data that happened a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, inside of Cribble Logstream, First off, I'm going to replay the data using a collector from AWS S3 storage. It could be MinIO back storage, uh, where the data is sitting locally in your environment. I can preview the data before I re-index the data and pull it back into the system. I select the date if I want it to maybe go back a week. I can change the filter because maybe you included tokens when you wrote the data out to the destination, like the source IP, the desk IP, the username, the department, the source type, the host. You can update your filter to match any specific recovery match that you would need to pull back in without having to pull back in all of the buckets that traditionally you might have to run a script on a single host. When we do the recovery using Cribble Logstream, all of the worker nodes are tasked to do the recovery where it load balances the recovery of the data. Here I'm choosing to preview the data before I pull it in against an absolute time range. For the next 60 seconds, I'm gonna look for 100 events. And this is a live capture directly from AWS. This is not a demo. And we see the events. Just like you saw earlier when I captured events into the sandbox, I can save this as a sample file. And once I've saved that sample, I can close out this sample, go back to my pipelines, review that sample right here, create additional routes and pipelines against this sample, uh, and recover the data to perhaps a different destination. Maybe I want to recover the data to a third party provider. Uh, maybe I move to a managed service provider and I want to transfer all data to them. Maybe I want to recover this data that used to exist within Splunk and now I want to recover it into Elastic. All of the things are possible because you have the ability to again, collect from any number of sources and land the data into any intended destination through the routes and the pipeline pairs. And that is the demo of Cribble Logstream. 
I hope you found value in today's presentation. Thank you. Amazing. Um, so you just saw, let me try to get to these next slide here. Okay. So you just saw a few general use cases uh, of Kribble Logstream. Hopefully that's got some gears turning for you around how Logstream can help you optimize your data. Uh, let's get a little bit more specific. So I mentioned today we'd be walking through enriching security data with our DNS lookup function. Um, essentially, the DNS lookup function within Kribble Logstream, it does two things. It offers two operations useful in enriching security and other data. Uh, the first is uh, DNS lookup, right? So um, I like to think of it as going from alphabetical to numerical, right? So DNS lookup is going to be based on that host name as text, and it's going to resolve to an IP address or to another record type. If you were listening closely in the demo, um, David mentioned, you know, maybe you have an internal um, uh, CIDR database, right, that you're checking things against. The second thing is a reverse DNS lookup, right? That's gonna resolve host names from the numeric IP address. You have this IP address um, and you wanna know what that domain is that it's coming from. Uh, so one example here, and then we'll uh, walk into this section, uh, go through this within the product actually. Um, we have an example pipeline here and what it does is it chains two functions, right? First we have an eval function um, that's going to define key value pairs for two alphabetical domain names. Um, and those could be literally anything. Um, and then uh, over there to the right, you'll see we also have two numeric IP addresses. So there are two things there. We have that Cribble domain, the Google domain. And then you also have that Cribble IP and that Google IP. Um, so next, what the DNS lookup function is going to do is just look up several record types for those two domain names. It's going to put each record type in its own output field. Um, so if we look at Cribble domain as an example here, um, and I'm looking at the fourth one down, we can see that it's checking against a text file, some sort of text resource record source type, um, and putting it in its own aptly named output field name called lookup Cribble domain txt. Um, finally, we get that same reverse DNS, um, the same functions reverse DNS lookup is going to retrieve domain names for the two IP addresses. So we had those numeric IP addresses. Um, it's going to look them up against the, the record um, and return that this is, a, you know, a Cribble IP and a Google IP. Um, so next up, uh, my colleague, Matthew Pike, also from our solutions engineering team, um, actually did a recording of walking through this within the product using another example. Um, so I will go ahead and play that for you guys now as well. Hello, this is Matthew Pike, a solutions engineer here at Cribble. When responding to a security incident, it's important that your data doesn't hinder your own investigation. Uh, sure, you can do some search time enrichments, for instance, adding geographical details. While well, this can be helpful, the geographical information relating to an IP address may have changed since the data was ingested. This can lead you down a path of chasing stale information, which just wastes your time. By enriching your data at ingest time with a blacklist lookup, a reverse DNS uh, record, uh, geographical statistics, you get the results you need at search time that are accurate to when the event happened and it was captured at ingest. Logstream makes this trivial. Uh, today, I'd like to show you how easy it is to start collecting this data now. So it's there when you need it tomorrow. We'll be taking in some Palo Alto firewall traffic, parsing underscore raw into event fields, and then doing GOIP, DNS, compromised host, and subnet identification lookups, and then adding index time fields to make querying as fast as possible when it gets into Splunk. So let's take a look. All right. All right, so I've got a firewall lookup enrichment route and firewall security enrichment pipeline. Let's take a look. So right now I have everything turned off in the pipeline so we can enable it one at a time to see the impacts. And I've got some previously sampled data here. All right. So I like to start every 
pipeline with a comment that explains uh, what the pipeline is for, who made it, if there was a sample uh, that was used to build it, what that sample name is. And I also like to comment kind of each section of a pipeline, if I can, functionally. So for the initial parser here, I'm able to just do one comment for that and it's a single function. So we'll turn this on and see how it looks. So what this is gonna do is parse underscore raw uh, using an extract. In this case, it's uh, underscore raw is a, is a comma separated value fields. So I'm going to pull out all the fields, but I'm only gonna keep the fields that I'm interested in, uh, which are source and destination IP address and message for right now. And the next section here, this is where we're gonna start performing the enrichment uh, on the events. Uh, first, we're gonna do, uh, and as you notice, I have a function uh, group here. Makes it easy you know, to, to group multiple functions together that are working on the same sort of uh, outcome. All right, so the first one is just doing a, oops. All right, first one is doing uh, just the GUIP lookups. And we can see here we've got uh, destination IP. Uh, since this one was a non-internet routable address, it doesn't return anything for that. Um, but here we've got source IP, which is internet routable. And we've got all of our interesting information that we need, but it's in this kind of uh, JSON object structure here. So we wanna get that out, keep only the things that we're interested in. And we'll use the, the next of these functions here for that. So next up is an eval, which is gonna get rid of the, some of the country code uh, versions that we're not interested in and a few other fields that we don't care about for our purposes. All right, now we can see that this has kind of been narrowed down quite a bit. It's still in this structure though, so we want to pull it out and put them in index time searchable fields. So what we're gonna do is flatten that uh, so we're going to flatten source GIP and desk GIP out of this uh, array structure here. Turn that on, save. Uh, now we can see they're in top level fields, but they're kind of named awkwardly. So let's adjust the names of those. We're going to just do a rename. I've got a regular expression here that basically gets rid of the middle parts of the name, makes it more reasonable. So let's take a look at that. All right, now they're in top level, you know, index time fields, and it's clearly named so we can see exactly what those are. All right, so now let's do uh, some more enrichment. Now that we have this good geographical information, and it makes uh, searching for events based on like, you know, the, the city name very quick because it's uh, of the type of field it is. All right, so let's look at uh, some lookups. Turn this section on. And the first one we're gonna do is real simple. It's just a reverse lookup on the source and destination IP and return a DNS name if it, if it has them. So let's take a look. All right, you can see here we've got the lookup, uh, the host name has been returned from the reverse lookup. So now we've got a good uh, host name to go along with those IP addresses. Next one uh, for certain subnets, we basically have a file that determines a, a friendly name for each subnet type. And we're gonna be able to search those subnets based on a CIDR match. So we've got this lookup file we're gonna to use to generate these names. I'll turn this on. I also want to turn on the next one which is doing the same thing, but for the destination IP, the first one was for the source IP. So we'll click save. And now that it's processed the events, we can see subnet usage, home worker nets, uh, subnet usage, home worker nets, and subnet usage, SAP net. So now we've got that, that friendly name that we can use. All right, so next we're going to do uh, a compromised IP lookup. So we're gonna say if either the source IP or the destination IP 
is in this compromised IPs list, either return true or false. So we'll go ahead and turn this guy on. So now we can see compromised faults, compromised faults. And the last one here, what we're going to do is rewrite raw with the message field. Uh, there's the Content is essentially the same, but we're going to just clean it up a little bit by getting rid of these, these uh, first few items. And then we're going to uh, set a index for security review. So when we look at it in Splunk, it'll be in the right index. And we're going to get rid of message severity and facility. So we're doing just a little bit of cleanup uh, just before it goes to the destination. We'll turn this guy on too. Now we can see... Uh, message has been removed we've added the security index or we've modified the security index sorry the index to go to security review and we've rewritten raw um, after doing all this we actually have a little bit of uh, savings in the size of raw and the size of the uh, entire event uh, about 20 percent but we still have all the same uh, the same items that we're interested in all this the same uh, information that we had previously we've just cleaned it up a bit and we've also added these nice rich uh, index time fields that contain all of this uh, great information we can use to retroactively look at a security incident so just to show the the final bit here we'll go into splunk and i'll choose the correct index and we'll just do a search on the last 24 hours and we can see the the data has been coming in we have all these nice fields here. So hopefully this has given you an idea of a way that you can enhance your data for security you know, purposes and just to make your search times faster and uh, more valuable to you. If you have any questions, let us know. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, now, at this time, I am more than happy to take any questions you may have about Cribble, log stream or anything you've seen here today, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> if you have any questions that came up for you during this hour, uh, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Should be at the bottom of your screen, I think, maybe at the top, depending on your settings, um, to submit those at this time. Um, and I will, yeah, I'll wait a few seconds, see if any questions come through. Just as um, as we're waiting here, um, if you are interested in seeing more ways that Cribble Lockstream could be used um, to help you either as you're going through a security investigation or just if you're a security engineer and just uh, ways that Cribble Lockstream can help you in your day to day, I would highly recommend um, checking out our resources page. If you go to Cribble dot io slash resources. Um, there are a lot more resources like this one, uh, blogs, white papers, um, other webinars, um, smaller, shorter briefs, right? Um, that just walk through different ways that Logstream could help make your day-to-day -day easier. Awesome. Well, I don't see any other questions coming through on my end. And um, so that's that. After I get the recording back from this call, I will share that with you guys via email. It'll also be available on our website at the, the page that I just mentioned, the resources page, if you'd like to rewatch it. Um, yeah, we'll also be doing another demo um, next Wednesday. Um, so I will see you there if you are interested. Talk to you later. Thanks. Thank you.